We are in our fourth message, going through this small but very packed book of the Bible, Jonah chapter 1. Today we'll be dealing with verses 8 through 13, but I would like to begin reading at verse 1 for the context. So Jonah chapter 1, and we will read the first 13 verses. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea, to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came unto him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us and we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought, and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up, and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. The title of the message this afternoon is Full Disclosure. You've undoubtedly heard that term before, <coughs> Full disclosure, it's kind of morphed into many areas of our life. But full disclosure in the proper sense of the word is, is a revelation of, of the complete truth regarding a matter uh, necessary, for example, uh, of, of, a, of a business transaction. And before that sale, that contract can become official, there has to be a, a full disclosure I could not sell you a business, for example, without telling you that I'm almost bankrupt and I'm in trouble with the government for my taxes. Full disclosure is usually all the, usually it's, it's all the information, but sometimes it has a lot of um, the dirty laundry, the bad issue, bringing out the hidden details, uh, the small stuff. In our context, in verses 8 through verse 13, the Word of God is going to bring about this disclosure or this revelation or this, this opening up or the, the bringing out of some of the personal aspects of the situation, some of the things that are below the surface initially. But the Word of God now is going to bring them out. And these details, some negative, some positive, but what they're going to do is, is lay a core, lay a foundation of what is going to follow. And so they're very necessary, which is why God's Word brings them out. 
So after a brief review, we're going to look at Jonah's disclosure by the Inquisition of the Mariners. They ask him these seven questions. Next, we'll look at the, the Gospel's disclosure by God's prophet. And then, in the last place, the Mariners' disclosure by Jonah's truth and their own nature. Well, first of all, and very briefly, a review from last time. Last time we saw the religion of the mariners. Some of their tenets of their religion we see every day in people's religion. Man is innately religious. At this point, the mariners are unconverted. But it's interesting that their religion, their beliefs, are on the surface and apparent, whereas Jonah's beliefs are asleep with him. We saw these mariners were given to prayer, idolatry, reformation. They, were, they had this ecumenical spirit, and they were given to chance. And all these miscellaneous ingredients went into what we would say was their religion. They did not know the Lord up to this point. Secondly, we looked at the rebuke of the shipmaster. Jonah was in a very deep sleep. It was the same, it's a, it's, a, it's a word that's not used very often. It's the same type of sleep that Adam was in. He was in a deep sleep when God opened up his side to get a rib to make Eve his wife. And in this life and death situation, here is Jonah asleep. And he is rebuked by the ship captain. He is rebuked by the world. And we made the comment that if we're going to be rebuked, let's be rebuked by a brother or sister. Let's not be rebuked by the world, which brings shame to the gospel. Every time we hear of some televangelist or somebody who's a who's who, supposedly in Christian circles, and they have a major fall, there is a rebuke brought against the gospel, upon, against God's people, against God himself. And then, lastly, we looked at the revealing of Jonah. And this segment had to do with God finding him out. Everything that Jonah tried to surround himself with and insulate himself from his situation, the particular ship that he was on, the sailors, the storm, his supposed destination, his sleeping, the fact that he was traveling incognito, Everything that Jonah had insulated himself from to run away from the presence of God vaporized in an instant by the sovereignty of God. The mariners did not find him out. The casting of lots did not find him out. God found him out. And we looked at, we used this as an opportunity to consider some of the aspects of the sovereignty of God. Sovereignty of God is a major theme in the book of Jonah. Mm -hmm. God preparing the great fish, preparing the gourd, preparing the east wind, preparing the worm. Uh, uh, God's sovereignty is, is very key and theme thematic throughout this book. But we mentioned relative to the sovereignty of God that God is free to use means. God is free to work without means. God can work above means. And God can even work against his means. God is above all and through all and in all. For of him and through him and to him are all things. And in a practical sense, we notice that God's sovereignty is universal, efficacious, and of course, irresistible. And in Jonah's case, we had to think about that verse that said, be sure your sin will find you out. And that verse, by the way, Moses speaking to the two and a half tribes, that verse is in the context of sins of omission. Jonah was found out. Well, today as we go on, under the title of full disclosure, let's see how the, the word of God now discloses or opens up these three areas. Number one, Jonah's disclosure by the inquisition of the mariners. 
So these sailors cast lots. Superstitious as they were, God uses it in spite of that thing. They want to know why that evil had befallen upon them and the lot falls upon Jonah. It's an interesting scene if you think about it. It's a life or death situation and their attention turns from the storm and trying to keep the ship afloat to this guy. It's all starting to come together now. This stranger who gets on the boat, this guy who's asleep in a life or death situation, the lot is cast upon him. I mean, I mean how many people are jumping on this, this cargo ship to get to Nineveh, excuse me, to get to, to Tarshish? In their mind, it's all coming together. And the lot is cast on him. And so they give him these seven questions. And Jonah now has to disclose his reality, his truth. He does so with, I think it's to some level at this point, he's been found out. So to some honesty, some nobility, some recognition of, of his truth. So I'd like to look at the first six questions in this segment of the message. First question. For whose cause, Jonah, is this evil upon us? Verse 5, they ask themselves the question. Verse 7, they ask Jonah. <coughs> Jonah has fled from the presence of the Lord. Jonah has offended God. God is now showing his displeasure. And he's using his sovereign means to resolve the situation. In reference to the, to the mariners, Jonah could have, should have, would have been a blessing to them as a prophet of God. Rather, this evil has come upon them, this storm, through his sin. His mouth is shut. What, what is he going to say for himself? He's under the condemnation, the rebuke of the mariners. He evidently had been certainly hesitant, afraid, not wanting to go to Nineveh. These individuals, this, this nation that was at enmity with the Israelites. But now here he is in the presence of these other heathen, these mariners, and he has no word of why this evil has come. It's obviously come upon them because of him. It is for his cause. Next question, what is thine occupation? Well, I'm a prophet. A prophet who is not faithful to the prophetic call. Unworthy to be called a prophet. As a prophet, Jonah would say, I, I was to declare God's word. I was to stand in the gap. I was chosen by God for this high and holy calling. No man takes this honor unto himself, just like the priesthood. God had to designate Jonah to be a prophet. He was to be a spokesman for God. Jonah, you're a prophet? Like, like Elijah? Elisha? Nathan? Like John the Baptist, who would come a few thousand years later? That's, that's what you are like? That kind of a prophet? The word occupation, what is that occupation? It's not just talking about a job, employment. It's, it's a more global thought. What is the business that you are to be about? What is your life's calling? This word occupation is, is a more all-consuming attribute of your life. Next question, Jonah, whence comest thou? He came from Gath Heifer. I came from the place God had me, and I'm going to a place God did not send me. Jonah, whence comest thou? It's, it's not a geographical question only. It's, it's actually also a non-geographical question. He came from standing before the Lord. He came from being in the king's palace, happy that the king, we looked at that from 2 Kings chapter 14, I believe, where they relied upon the prophetic word of God for their actions and their policies and what they would do. He had that faithful ministry at one point. He was, he was, he was there. And of course, under that 
element of blessedness, why would you leave Jonah? Why would you come here, the middle of the sea? Verse 8, there's this cascading effect of these questions. There's this aggregate. All these questions are going to add up to this cumulative effect. What is thy country, Jonah? The land of privilege. The holy land. Remember, he was a, a, a pre-exilic prophet before the exile. So he dwelt in the land that God gave by conquest to the people. This really choice land. If you recall when we talked about the Jordan River crossing, we saw that God's word gave four primary adjectives to the word that he would give them. He said it was a rich land, the land that flowed with milk and honey. God kept saying, it's rich. It's rich. It was labor free. They were going to inherit all, these, all this stuff without having to work for it. God said it was their inheritance. It was their inheritance. And God also said it was the best he could do. In Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 6, God said, The land that I spied out for them flowing with milk and honey, it was the glory of all the lands. Jonah, you, you came from there? A rich land? A land without laboring and working? That place that was the inheritance of God? The best God could do? There's other descriptions of that land, but this is where Jonah came from. That, that country that, that was, had the highest privilege that God could give a country to give to his people. It was a state of blessedness, a place of additional future promises, a place of security, a place of God's presence. The temple was there. That temple indicative of God's faithfulness to all of his promises that he gave to his people. Verse 8, next question, of what people art thou? I'm a Hebrew, a member of that race, that people's group that God chose out from the world to be a special people, to be his people, to be a people that would worship him. This is the God who made land and sea. This is the God who is over all. Of what people art thou, Jonah? He was an Israelite, the special people that whom, to whom pertained the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Special people. And then, why hast thou done this? That had to be a question that, that went the deepest. Why have you done done this. It's, it's unanswered, at least the scripture does not give us an answer. Jonah does not attempt to bring excuses. Jonah, there's, there's no there's no answer. The cumulative effect, the cascading effect of all of these questions get to the point where we realize that, that Jonah was, was one time in fellowship with God. Jonah was God's man for God's hour at that place. And then he has backslidden. He's given in to, to this carnal thinking. He's indulged perhaps the lust of the flesh. He is no longer pursuing God. He is pursuing everything but God. Even though he was happier in his former days, he was more blessed. He knew he was in God's will. He had tasted and seen that the Lord was gracious. And now he's making a 3,000 mile beeline to get as far away from God as he can. Jonah's truth, Jonah's reality, Jonah's disclosure of what had been hidden up to this point is, I think, painful for Jonah. That this truth is brought out. And I think as he's verbalizing it, He's speaking it 
I think he, it impacts him with this fresh realization, the light of what the reality is as he's verbalizing it and saying it. It's making this impact upon himself. I think Christians, all of us, need to reevaluate our standing with God. The underlying thought as the mariners are talking with Jonah is that it is a big, big deal. It's a very big deal be a child of God. It's not something that should produce a shallow, a runaway, a disobedient, a lukewarm life or lifestyle. And whether or not you are a backslider, a runaway, a persevering on the good sense of the word, these type of questions should be asked by us from a self-examination standpoint along our Christian pathway. Let me ask you a question. What is your occupation? Now in this room we have, we have a CPA, we have a systems analyst, we have a mechanical engineer, we have a teacher, we have retirees. All of those, those professions can be a life's calling as God places us in those places. It might be a status symbol but what is your occupation? The fact is your occupation is you are a child of God. That is the business that you are to be about. That is what your, your, your calling has, has put you in. That's what's supposed to concern you. Your identity is, is a child of God. That's who your identity should be. First and foremost, a child of God, an ambassador of his, his workmanship, a steward of the grace of God that is in you. This is what this word occupation means, your life's calling. Yeah, we were all called to support our families. We were all called with some calling. But at the end of the day, you're a child of God. Jonah said he was a prophet, and, and part of being a prophet is he had to be chosen of God to be in that position. As a child of God, he has chosen you in him from before the foundation of the world. Your Christian life is to be your occupation, handling the word of God. Maybe not proclaiming it in a public place, maybe sharing it by way of evangelism. Your calling is to stand in the gap, to be a spokesman for God. Jonah, as a reluctant prophet, as a backslider, he had to know that, you know, it was so blessed to attend church service. It was so blessed to, to be in Bible study and prayer meeting and, and, and think about God all the time while I was on the job, not falling asleep, meditating upon God. Second question for all of us, whence comest thou? Where did you come from? How did you get here to being a child of God in this little room worshiping God with all of us? Well, like Pilgrim in Pilgrim's Progress, you were taken out of the city of destruction and put into God's kingdom. Out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Rescued from being an enemy of God. Sometimes we forget, where did I come from? I was an enemy of God. Did you come from a Christian home? I constantly, not constantly, but I'm always talking to Lori. You know, she was raised in a Christian home. And I said, do you realize the blessedness of that? I think, you know, both Pastor Joe and myself we were early 20s before we were converted in the summer of 1976 at different military bases, kind of, kind of aligning. But there's 20 odd years where we didn't, we didn't, I knew nothing about the Word of God. I never had it taught to me. 
Do you come from a privileged place where, where you were taught the scriptures from an early childhood? Man, you're blessed. What is your country? Your country is the land of privilege. Not outwardly, but spiritually. God calls his bride uh, Beulah in, in, in Isaiah. You're married to the creator of the universe. Your country is the land that flows with milk and honey, spiritually speaking. Where the sanctuary of God is. You come from that place of, like God's land, richness labor free, an inheritance, the best the Lord could give. Do you ever get upset with the church, bored with the church, wish things could be better? You know, the church is the best God could do. You say, yeah, but there's problems, there's inefficiencies, there's all these, well, of course there is, because it's us. But God wants it to be the best he could give. He wants to inhabit the sanctuary. He wants to be glorious in our presence. He wants to, to enliven our hearts to worship him. Of what people art thou? I'm from the people of God. The people that God has chosen to be the deposit of truth and a witness to divine character. And I'm from the people that have been given the adoption. Have you been adopted into God's family? The glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises. You see, Jonah's answers to these questions really do a, a parallel or they're a template that can fall on the life of the believer. We have to ask ourselves these questions. What people are we from? From the, the Christian country, the Christian community. Why hast thou done this? Jonah, why have you left? Why are you in rebellion? Why are you reluctant? Why do you not trust God? Why have we done this if we are a runaway? If we are reluctant? If we are backslidden? If we are lukewarm? Jonah could give no answers, no excuses that would hold water. The chickens had come home to roost. He makes this disclosure, this revelation. He has sinned against God and man. He has closed off his conscience. He has closed off the light of God's word. All of these questions we should revisit and ask ourselves. We should verbalize so we understand afresh the absolute blessedness and privilege of being a child of God. And as one writer said, it's better we ask the question now than, we have, than when we have to give a full disclosure before God's judgment throne. Now is the time to sort through these questions and find out where we are and ask for God's help to, to realign us where we should be. Again, it's a big deal to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. A very big deal. Mm -hmm. And Jonah has this reality check as he realizes his truth is not what it ought to be. Secondly, Jonah's disclosure by the Inquisition. Excuse me. That was Jonah's disclosure by the Inquisition of the Mariners. Next, the Gospel's disclosure by God's prophet. Now, I'm using two words here on purpose. I'm using the word gospel to denote the plight the mariners are in for reasons that will soon become apparent. On the surface, they want the storm to be calmed. Mm. And I'm using the word prophet instead of Jonah because here I think the prophetic office is rising above Jonah's condition. Jonah is rebellious, reluctant, backslidden, out of order with God. But the prophetic office now is going to rise above Jonah and it's going to deliver the remedy for this dire situation, the real issue at hand. So here's the last question. What shall we do unto thee, 
that the sea may be calm unto us. Jonah, the prophet, is the pivot point for the escape right now. And now that he has confessed this, this truth, he's spoken up, he has an answer for this, this problem of the storm, this life and death issue. He says, he's going to say, take me up, cast me forth into the deep, into the sea, and then that sea will be calm unto you. Because it's been for my sake that this tempest has come. So here we see the beginning of, of this change where Jonah is going to become a picture or a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, the sign of Jonah, where the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be foreshadowed or pictured in what Jonah is going to go through. The Lord Jesus Christ, of course, taking the sinner's place in all three of those, burial, death, resurrection. Jonah's death here is the only thing that can save the mariners. And so he says, take me up, cast me forth into the sea, and the sea will be calm. And so here this, this, this account is transitioning where Jonah, who's going to be swallowed by the whale and eventually uh, 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 stay there three days and three nights and then be cast up, is going to be the very sign of Jonah that, God, that Jesus alludes, alludes to in Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. But here, as jo uh, Jonah is speaking these words, he's talking about this substitutionary atonement. You remember what Caiaphas, the high priest, said? Caiaphas in the Gospel of John, chapter 11. Caiaphas, when the issue was Jesus Christ and, and his doctrine and teaching and followers causing this, this riot or this division among the people. And what does Caiaphas say? You know nothing at all, he says, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people than that the whole nation perish. The scripture goes on to say he spoke not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and not that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God scattered abroad. The storm will only stop if Jonah is cast into the sea. God's judgment, God's wrath, can only be assuaged by the only Savior of the world. I don't have a name, but one writer said this, the entire world vessel of humanity is plunging through the waves of judgment towards the reefs of eternal doom and destruction because of the sin of man against God. Soon it would plunge into the abyss or be dashed in pieces upon the jagged rocks of the wrath of a holy God. There was only one way the storm could be stilled. The sin issue must be settled. Someone had to die in order that others could live. And again, we're transitioning into the sign of the prophet Jonah, where Jesus responds to the scribes and the Pharisees who wanted a sign. And he said, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The sign of Jonah focuses on those three, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you know the story of Jonah, you know this is the entire path that the prophet Jonah is on. Next time we're going to see how this develops. This will in fact come to pass. It will happen. And Jesus will use this as a solid illustration of that very necessary gospel of death, burial, and resurrection on our behalf. We'll have more to say about that next time. But this glorious truth does, I think, reveal and disclose to us our desperate need for him. We are much like, we were much like 
those sailors upon that ship. And there was only one way that that storm could be stilled. When the last place this afternoon, the mariner's disclosure by Jonah's truth in their own nature. Jonah's truth, the prophetic office, the word of God, is doing what it is supposed to do, shining light on situations, on people. And the mariners now are going to reveal, knowingly or unknowingly, they're going to disclose or reveal two things about themselves by their actions. We already know a couple things about the mariners. We already know they're able-bodied seamen who could make this 3,000-mile ocean voyage. We already know they have become desperate, difficulties displaying true character. We know they're given to idolatry and chance. We know they're perceptive. There was something unique about this storm, something unique about this passenger that we picked up. We know that the oarsman, the captain, the navigator, the galley crew, every one of those guys had a skill, a knowledge, or an ability that equipped them to do something that you could never do. Assuming none of you have been mariners, the sailors back then. Mm -hmm. But you have something that they don't have. You can navigate spiritual difficulties. They could not do that. Mm -hmm. We previously noted that the insecurity of the mariners is not from the storm. It's their reaction was pointing to the fact that they did not have a biblical Christian worldview that flowed out from a vital true relationship with God through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. They couldn't interpret the storm from a spiritual standpoint. And now they're going to open up two more things about them that I believe leads to their conversion. The first thing they disclose about themselves is fear. Fear. At Jonah's disclosure... They fear exceedingly. Jonah said he was a Hebrew. He feared the Lord. He told them probably more than what's in the text. But after he told them this in verse 9, they say, they find out in verse 10, it says, Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said, Why hast thou done that? Back in verse 5, when the storm came up, they were afraid. They feared. They were astonished and were terrified at what God was doing. But when they hear about the Lord, when they hear about Jehovah God, the scripture says they were exceedingly afraid. The word afraid is the same word as verse 5, but now it's added the word exceedingly, which is a compound of two words put together in front of afraid. They had feared the storm. It was unnatural. It was powerful. The ship was like to be broken. It put them in a situation of life or death. They were afraid. But now when they hear, for the first time probably, about Jehovah God, they are exceedingly afraid. This is the God. This is the God of creation. This is the God who made the sea and the dry land. This God is so jealous to accomplish his perfect will that he will intersect the life of others and interrupt the life of these sailors to wake up his erring prophet. This was the God with whom they had to do. This is reality. And they feared him exceedingly. In our day, I think one reason people do not fear God is because many churches have truncated, they've misrepresented who God is. A God that will be a friend, a God that will help you get out of trials or jams, maybe a God who will bless you with money or good health. 
The God of the Bible is a God to be feared. He is majestic. He is glorious in holiness. He, he dwells in light that you cannot approach unto. God's people are no longer instructed to perfect holiness in the fear of God. These mariners are, are getting this picture, a little tiny picture of who God is, and they fear exceedingly. The fear of God, the beginning of wisdom. And contrary to what the world might think, this is not an ignorant fear. This is not an irrational fear. It's an apprehension of this God of creation. This God who on one hand is, is running the universe and also very interested in this one little speck of sand, this Jonah guy over here. This fear has reduced them to where they were. They were exposed as sinners. They want to try to treat Jonah with some common grace. They want to look for an escape. This fear, they're disclosing now the reality of who they are. They're apart from God. And they very correctly and rightly fear exceedingly. They fear God. But they also disclose who they are by nature. They disclose an attitude of works. I want to make this a spiritual application to this text. What is, what is Jonah's answer? I have to die, be buried, and resurrect. But they say, no. Nevertheless, they had the answer. Spirit, by way of spiritual application, man has this, this, this answer of the gospel. You have to trust in him. This one man is the entire gospel right there. Jesus Christ, the God-man. No. The men rode hard. Nevertheless, that's a big word there. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring the ship to the land. But they could not because the sea was tempestuous against them. Man will make every desperate effort to save himself, to override the gospel, works, labor, law-keeping, in spite of the gospel answer that's, that's presented to them. Jonah is basically saying, take me. No, we're going to work. Take me. The sea will be calm. They don't want to do it. And so they rowed very hard. And we're all familiar with the oars that people use to row to land. Moral reform. We saw that from verse 5. Good works. Titus says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Man will attempt to keep the law. That's, that's, that's a hard oar. I, I've rowed a little rowboat, not rowed a big galley ship like this, but when you row, not only your arms, but your shoulder, your neck, your legs, your thighs, everything is into that. I mean, you're, you're straining. All of your muscles are straining. And, and that's very sadly what people try to do. Paul said, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, Christ is dead in vain. Why did Christ die if I am going to work for my merit righteousness? So many oars, spiritual associations, sacramentalism. If you want to know what God thinks about sacramentalism, read Isaiah chapter 1. Mm -hmm. Orthodox doctrine, gospel standards, penance. I didn't say repentance, I said penance. All of these oars, all of these efforts will fail. They are of the flesh. They are insulting to God. It's not that God just has this neutral view of them. They're insulting to God. They are boastful. They gender to pride. 
the effect. It's, it's, it's a terrible morass that man has fallen into. But that's what these sailors are doing. Jonah says, take me. Jesus Christ says, take me. No, I'm going to work for it. These two are going to eventually lead to the conversion of these mariners. This fear is going to lead them. And it's going to, this idea of fear, by the way, is going to continue with them. Their works are going to lead them to God. How? Because they're going to see they fail miserably. They realize their works are futile. Nothing good has come out of them. This is the very thing that Paul found out in, in Philippians chapter 3. All those things that were gained to him, those he counted lost for Christ, that he might win Christ. Not have a righteousness of his own, but the righteousness of, which is of God in him. These mariners disclose the reality of, of a near God, and they have this fear. Their works disclose that they are just like fallen man, Rejection of the prophetic office, try to make a way of escape for themselves. These three, I think the word of God reveals, discloses as this, this, this story, this account begins to open up. Jonah's disclosure by the inquisition of the mariners. The gospel's disclosure by the prophet. And the mariners' disclosure by Jonah's truth and by their own nature. And we're going to have to leave these guys rowing for the next couple of weeks before <laughs> they become saved. And, and they're going to sweat and strain and labor, and they're not going to get there. And they wouldn't get there in a million years. But let me leave you with a closing thought, a closing application. The Word of God, part of the business of the Word of God is disclosure or, or revelation or shining light. And remember that scripture that says, in thy light, we see light. As uncomfortable sometimes as it might be, the light of God's word needs to examine us and search us out. In thy light, we see light. If Jonah had, if the mariners had, the Ninevites will, as, as gospel light comes into the heart and soul of man, we see light. We learn more. We, we understand more. And that's one takeaway that we should get from this. As everything is opening up, yeah, what about me? What about the light that God can show me? Am I, have I been like Jonah? Have I been like the mariners? This story is so packed. But like I said, next time we'll, we'll see the, now the beginning of the sign of Jonah. We'll see the conversion of the mariners. And then we'll move into chapter 2, which is a tremendous, tremendous prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Father, we thank you that this account has so much for us, particularly perhaps individually as believers. Father, we thank you for the gracious way your word does, when need be, find us out. And Father, we desire every one of us here, desire to be that workmanship of yours that has been created in Christ Jesus unto good works as a fruit of our belief. Father, bless thy word to our hearts. Continue to reveal in, in your light. Continue to reveal. Reveal to us the Lord Jesus Christ that we might walk with him in sincerity and truth. Thank you, Father, for this afternoon, this worship service. We love you, we adore you, we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.